Part 1 First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Hi, Joanna. What's the matter? You look a bit depressed. Hi, Kamal. I've just been reading this article in the newspaper about how difficult it is for sociology students to get a job after they graduate. They always want people with work experience. How do you get work experience if they won't give you a job? It's an impossible situation. Yes, I know. It's a real problem. And the article says that some people spend a year or more living at home doing unpaid voluntary work just to get something to put on their CVs. Really boring stuff like photocopying and addressing envelopes. I don't want to do anything like that. I want a real job. It's the elections for the Students' Union Committee posts next month here at the university. All the positions are up for election. Academic officer, sports What's officer... What's your point? And the position of Equal Opportunities Officer is coming up for election. I'm still not sure what you're getting at. Why don't you stand for it? The post starts in June. You're well known at the university, and I think you would be good at it. Equal Opportunities Officer? That sounds great. Isn't that the Students' Union Officer who promotes equality within the university? Yes, that's right. They raise awareness of equal opportunities for everyone in the university and promote the issue around campus. I'd love to do something for women on campus, but what about my studies? It's a paid sabbatical post. Sabbatical? Yes. That means you take a year off and then start your studies again. Meanwhile, you get really good work experience and you can earn money at the same time. That sounds really interesting. But how do I get elected? You go to the Students' Union, fill in an application form and just give it to the Union. Then, I guess, you need to put together a manifesto and try to get people to support you. I'll help you with your campaign and I'll help you with publicity materials like posters for the notice boards and leaflets to hand out to everyone. It sounds really exciting. What exactly does the Equal Opportunities Officer do? I'm not really sure. Let's have a look at the Students' Union website. There it is. Hmm. The Equal Opportunities Officer is responsible for anything which concerns women and equal rights and is responsible to the Students' Union Executive Committee for making sure that any racism or sexism is dealt with. Students' Union Officers have to be available for students to talk about any problems they have and try to help them. I would love that part of the job, giving help and advice to students. The whole reason I want to work in social services is to help people. That would be very good experience. It's a big responsibility too. It also says that you're in charge of a budget and you would be responsible for managing a team of people. It's good experience for a management position in the future. Now I'm getting really excited. What about the day-to-day -day responsibilities? It says here that the Equal Opportunities Officer acts on any health and safety issues. The Equal Opportunities Officer represents all the students on university committees like the Safety Committee and the Equal Opportunities Committee. Lots of meetings, then. I don't think I would enjoy all those meetings quite so much. My first aid certificate might be useful for safety issues. Very useful. And you would supervise the running of the crash. Make sure that students with young children have access to childcare, that sort of thing. Oh look, the Equal Opportunities Officer also has responsibility for the university bus service. Perhaps I could even get it to run on time. No, don't be too ambitious. We have to get you elected first. Let's take a walk to the union office. Maybe we can meet the Equal Opportunities Officer and talk to her about the job. Great, let's go. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10.
That's about all I want to say about the course and coursework. As you heard, it's very intensive and there's a lot of work to do. So, how to deal with all the work? It's really important to make sure you have good study skills. It makes the difference between failing, just passing, or doing well on any course. There are workshops given by student service counsellors on study skills, but I just want to put you in the picture with a quick overview of useful study skills. There are five points I want to make here. The main thing is to get organised. The first thing you need to do as soon as you get your timetable and reading list is to draw up a plan of study. Time management is what all students are bad at. Unfortunately, it's what they need to be very good at. Make up a timetable and put in all the things like lab work, lectures, seminars, and tutorials that you will attend. Make a note of exactly what work you will do for each of your courses. Where do we get that from? Your lecturer will tell you exactly how you will be assessed at the end of the course. Make sure that you add in time for reading, preparing seminars, and so on. Put deadlines into your study plan and put these deadlines into your computer to remind you when they are. With deadlines, you need to be realistic and know yourself. Are you the kind of person who leaves things to the last minute? If you are, make sure you remind yourself about deadlines well in advance. Don't leave things to the last minute. That sounds like me. Aim to have a balanced life of academic work, a paid job if you need one, and social activities. As a rough guide, you should be doing forty hours of academic work per week, and five to fifteen hours for a part-time job, no more. The second point is don't be late or miss lectures. Remember, the person giving the lecture is probably the same person who sets your exams. In lectures, you hear information from the person who will be testing you on it. You will take much longer to gather it from other sources. Classes offer an opportunity to ask questions about difficult material, and you won't miss extra information. Thirdly, make sure that you regularly re-read your notes from lectures, books, and handouts. This will help you remember what you have done. Finally, two more important points: we expect you to work long hours on your own. The information we give you in tutorials and lectures is just a starting point, often comprising the main points of themes of the subject. After this, it's up to you to go into detail about the topic and be familiar enough on certain points to give a seminar on it if asked. The next and last point is this: you need to think about what you read and any information you get on a topic. We are looking for students who can evaluate material critically. Students who can think critically, students who simply read and remember information, do not make as good progress as students who think about the subject and form their own opinions on it, based on looking at the subject from all points of view. So we are not just learning facts and figures. Facts and figures are an important part of learning, but not the most important thing. It's what you do with them that is critical. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Zoe goes to talk to her academic advisor. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. How are you getting on, Zoe? Feeling at home yet?、Mm, well, more or less. There are still some things I need to buy, and I haven't found my way to all the facilities yet. But I really love the campus, and I've already made a few friends. Fantastic. 
Now let's see what we can do to get your studies off to the right start too. You're on the foundation course, so you can take up to eight modules. What we advise is that you take four modules in the first semester, and assuming everything goes well, four in the second. Have you decided which you want to take in this semester? I haven't made my mind up yet. I can't decide whether to take principles of marketing or introduction to international trade. Well, that depends on your career goal. You're planning to work in the biotechnology sector, aren't you? Uh, well, that's my present thinking, but I guess I might change my mind. Right. Well, marketing is a broad, general subject that you will find really useful in a number of careers. International trade, on the other hand, is more specific. That's fine if you're sure it's the sort of work you want to do. A lot of students start off thinking about that option because it seems glamorous, but marketing can also be an exciting career, and there's a wide choice of jobs. Maybe you ought to wait until your career ideas are a bit more definite before you go down that road. Yes, I see. I could take international trade next year, couldn't I? Sure, you could do international finance as well. So, in your first semester, you've got principles of marketing. Introduction to economics, banking, and finance, and let's see, principles of financial accounting. How do you feel about that as a package? It's okay, I think. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. But I'm a bit worried about the maths. There'll be some statistics to do, won't there? Basic statistics, yes, but nothing more difficult than your last year of school maths. I know, but our maths syllabus was a bit old-fashioned. Mostly algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and stuff. Hardly any stats. Right. Well, it sounds as if you could do with the maths brush-up course. Can I arrange for you to attend just the classes on statistics, if you like? That'd be great. I didn't want to do the whole of maths again, but the stats classes would make me feel much more confident. Thanks. Hang on a minute. There's one more thing. Your English. Now you know you have to reach a satisfactory standard in English by the end of your first year to be allowed to go on to the main BSc course. Yeah. Now I'm in an English-speaking environment, and I have to speak English all the time. I'm sure I'll be all right. It certainly helps, but speaking isn't everything. You'll have to get your reading up to the standards where you can understand the books on your course reading list quickly. To get the information and ideas, you need to write your essays. That means you have to develop a high level of comprehension skills. You'll never get through the course material. If you try to read the books intensively from cover to cover, that's why our language skills development program gives you a series of graded academic texts to study and answer questions on a limited time. You'll probably find it hard at first, having to work against the clock without a dictionary. How can I improve my skimming and scanning skills? Good question. For that, you'll have to do a range of specially designed exercises. Sometimes these will be from a transparency because it is often how the lecture material is presented. Sometimes I think I'll never learn all the vocabulary. English is such an enormous language. I know what you mean. English is the biggest language ever. At least three hundred and fifty thousand words. Even Winston Churchill only knew sixty thousand, so they say. But as an academic student, you can get a lot of help from the academic word list by Avril Coxhead. Of Victoria University, that's in Wellington, New Zealand. I've studied word lists, of course, but how does this one help? The academic word list is based on a survey of three and a half million words of academic text. It contains five hundred and seventy families of the words most commonly found in academic texts. Well, that's apart from the two thousand most useful words in English. They come in a separate list. You can see copies of both in the library. You said word families. Do you mean words that are similar? In a way, yes. It means that all the different grammatical forms 
of a word are listed together, so you can see the nouns, verbs, adjectives, forms with prefixes and suffixes, and so forth. It'll be clearer when you look at it. Anyway, Avril Coxhead gives you really great hints about how to learn the words, so it shouldn't be too daunting. The trouble is, I tend to forget the words I learn. Well, there are two ways you can tackle that. First, always try to learn the words in a context. Either learn a whole sentence using a word, or learn a phrase that the word typically comes in. We call phrases like that collocations. That's a new one on me. Collocations. I'd better make a note of it. You do that. You can find collocations in most modern dictionaries. Anyway, as I was saying, there's a second study aid I recommend for vocabulary learning. When you get an assignment, take a sheet of paper and write four headings: words I can use, words I can recognise but can't use, words I'm not sure of, words I don't know. Don't bother with the simple words, of course. Then go back after two weeks and look at the list again. Can you move any of the words into a better column? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Hear a discussion between three people in a university tutorial. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about city traffic and the motor car. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. We're very pleased to welcome Professor Isaac Nebworth to our tutorial group today, and he's come to share one of his pet passions with us: city traffic and our Western dependence on the motor car. I believe questions are quite welcome throughout. Thank you. Well, I know you're all very familiar with the superhighway here in Melbourne, but do superhighways automatically lead to super wealth, as our politicians would have us believe? I think not. Can you give us an example of what you mean exactly? Sure. Well, by continuing to encourage this dependence on the motor car, we simply create more congestion and more urban sprawl. And you can see that here in Melbourne, right under your nose. Excuse me. I would just like to say that I feel the sprawl is part of the city. The freeways mean people can enjoy the benefits of living away from the centre on larger blocks with gardens. But still be able to drive back into the city centre for work or entertainment. Well, I'm not convinced that people want to do that. And is our money being well spent? It may be okay for you now, but come back to me in five years' time. Let's take City Link, for example, the new freeway here in Melbourne. Well, I use the freeway all the time. I think it's great. Ah, yes, but it cost two billion dollars to build. And you could have gotten ten times the value by putting the money into public transport. If you give the automobile road space, it will fill that space, and you'll soon find you'll be crawling along your city link. But surely you cannot simply blame the car. Some of the blame must rest with governments and city planners. Well, there is an argument, surely, that building good roads is actually beneficial because most new cars these days are highly efficient. They use far less petrol than in the past, and emissions of dangerous gases are low. Old congested roads, on the other hand, encourage traffic to move slowly, and it's the stationary cars that cause the pollution and smog. Whereas good roads increase traffic speeds, and thus the amount of time cars are actually on the roads. Well, this is the old argument put forward by the road lobby, but 
For me, it's clear-cut. Roads equal cars, which equal smog. Public transport is the way to go. In the second part of the discussion, the professor talks about public transport in different cities. Look at questions 25 to 30. Now, on that topic of public transport, I read somewhere recently that Australia isn't doing too badly in the challenge to increase the use of public transport. Better than America, granted. But by comparison with Canada, it's not so good. For instance, if you compare Toronto with the US metropolis of Detroit, only 160 kilometers away, in Detroit, only 1% of passenger travel is by public transport, Whereas in Toronto, it's 24%, which is considerably better than Sydney, which can only boast 16%. Well, I think it's encouraging that our least car-dependent city is actually our largest city. 16% of trips being taken on public transport in Sydney isn't too bad. But it's a long way behind Europe. Take both London and Paris, for instance, where 30% of all trips taken are on public transport. Well, they do both have an excellent underground system. And Frankfurt comes in higher still at 32%. I understand that they've been very successful in Copenhagen at ridding the city of the car. Can you tell us anything about that experiment? Yes, indeed. Copenhagen is a wonderful example of a city that has learned to live without the motor car. Back in the 1960s, they adopted a number of policies designed to draw people back into the city. For instance, they paid musicians and artists to perform in the streets. They also built cycle lanes, and now 30% of the inhabitants of Copenhagen use a bicycle to go to work. Sydney, by comparison, can only boast 1% of the population cycling to work. It could have something to do with all the hills. Then they banned cars from many parts of the city, and every year 3% of the city parking is removed. And by constantly reducing parking, they've created public spaces and clean air. Really? There are also freely available bicycles, which you can hire for practically nothing. And, of course, they have an excellent public transport system. Well, that's all very well for Copenhagen, but I'd just like to say that some cities are just too large for a decent public transport system to work well, particularly in areas with low population. Because if there aren't many people using the service, then they don't schedule enough buses or trains for that route. I accept that there is a vicious circle here, but people do need to support the system. And secondly, the whole process takes so long because usually you have to change. You know, from bus to train, that sort of thing. And that can be quite difficult. Ultimately, it's much easier to jump in your car. And often it turns out to be cheaper. Sure, but cheaper for whom? You or society? We have to work towards the ideal and not give in all the time because things are too difficult. Anyway, let's move on to some of the results of the survey, which I think you'll agree. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. A second session on interview skills. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Hello there everyone and welcome to our second session on interview skills. Now we have already looked at what to say in the interview and what to wear. So let's consider non-verbal behaviour or as it is more often called body language. Believe it or not, research has shown that this is what makes the strongest impression on people we meet. Frequent eye contact is one aspect of body language which goes down very well with interviewers and creates a good impression. Looking at people means that you're sure of yourself and confident. In fact, one famous car company even makes a note of the level of eye contact candidates make during their recruitment process for this very reason. So it is very important to maintain eye contact, but be careful how you do it. Avoid staring, as this is a sign of hostility. But avoiding eye contact altogether and looking away or down is even worse. But the general message is maintain that eye contact. Believe me, the eyes have it. Now, along with eye contact, smiling is one of the other important non-verbal actions which say more to the interviewer than any answers you give. A good way to create a good impression during the first few minutes of your interview is to smile warmly when you meet the person or people who will be interviewing you. It shows them that you are relaxed. Facial scanning takes a triangular route, from the eyes down to the mouth and back to the eyes. Even when you aren't speaking, an interviewer will be noticing your mouth, so give a relaxed smile whenever you feel it is appropriate. Now, not surprisingly, interviewers pay most attention to a person's face or head during an interview, and they certainly pick up a lot on what they see. Researchers have identified nodding as going down very well with interviewers. This simple gesture shows that you are listening and paying attention. Another useful head gesture is to tilt your head slightly to one side. Now this reinforces that you are listening well to what the interviewer is saying to you. However, tilting your head back isn't such a good idea as this signals arrogance. And drooping your head forward indicates that you are lacking in confidence. And as we all know, that is exactly the opposite of what an interviewer wants to see. So the message is, mind your head. Now posture, or the way that you carry yourself, is an important area of body language to be aware of. And it is one of the first body language signals that interviewers read as you enter a room. Posture also matters when you're sitting down. A well-supported position, with your shoulders square and sitting full back on the chair, will give the impression that you are confident, which is just what the interviewer wants to see. I once interviewed a candidate who perched right on the edge of her chair throughout. I kept feeling that she was about to run out of the room in terror. However, occasionally leaning forward slightly when the interviewer is speaking reinforces the message that you are keen and interested, as well as showing the interviewer that you're actually listening to what they are saying. But don't overdo it by leaning too far forward. That can be a bit distracting for the interviewer. Now we all tend to use our hands to gesture, especially when we are explaining something or as we become involved in what we are saying. This is fine. It shows that we are keen and perhaps even excited about something. However, what can work against someone at an interview is when they fidget. This kind of moving about is of course what we do when we are nervous and fidgeting can be very distracting to watch. So if this is a problem for you when you get nervous, it is a good idea to practice sitting with your hands gently resting in your lap or on the arms of the chair. Try not to fold your arms though, as this tends to look uncomfortable or hostile. But whatever movements you make, be careful with your hands. They need to be kept well away from your mouth, head or face. In fact, experts say that when a hand flies up to or over a person's mouth, it implies that the person is worried or wound up about something. For most of us, staying calm in an interview situation is a challenge, so putting in a bit of practice in advance will help. So, to end with, here are a couple of suggestions on how to improve our body language. A good idea is to choose a role model, such as an actor or fictional character, or a public figure or someone you know. Then sit calmly and imagine that you are this person. Now, other countries have different body language signals. So remember that if you are being interviewed abroad, you may want to check if there are any special gestures to avoid. 
it's also a good idea to get used to reading body language signals. You can do this by simply watching how people interact in public places, such as on the streets or in restaurants. And finally, when people have struck up a rapport, it is reflected through the natural mirroring of each other's body language movements. So you can use this to your advantage by occasionally mirroring the interviewer's own movements. For example, if they lean over to one side, you can do the same a few seconds later. It helps to create a special effect known as similar to me. But don't do it too often or the interviewer will notice. Now, any questions before we move on to interview listening skills? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.